الله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد few weeks ago when we were looking at the tafsir of surah al-baqarah we were analyzing verse number 2 and 3 of surah al-baqarah in which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says zalik al-kitab la rayba fihi hudal lil-muttaqin that that book there is no doubt in it hudal lil-muttaqin and it is a source of guidance for the god fearing people and then from verse number 3 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to mention some characteristics and some qualities of these god fearing people that one of the characteristics and uh, qualities of these god fearing people is alladhina yu'minuna bil ghaib is that they believe in the unseen without seeing the angels without seeing rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam without seeing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they believe in the existence of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they believe in rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they believe that angels exist they believe that the prophets who were sent before them like hazrat isa alayhi salam hazrat musa alayhi salam hazrat sulaiman alayhi salam they believe in all the prophets and that's why there is actually a hadith which can be found in the very last page of mishkat al musabih where the prophet of allah sallallahu alayhi salam he praises this ummah and he says that once the rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam was with a group of companions and rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam asked them that who do you think who is iman or whose faith is more stronger than uh, out of all the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whose iman or whose faith is the more stronger so the sahaba they replied by saying that the angels that we think that the angels their faith is the more stronger so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied that no because the angels they are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time then their faith is not the strongest now strongest here being like the, the you know the best you could say uh, of faith and then the sahaba replied by saying oh and then most likely it's the prophets that their faith are the more stronger then rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied by no because the prophets they are the messengers of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they receive wahi and divine revelation every day so therefore you know their faith isn't like the most best or is not the most stronger then the sahaba replied that then it's us the sahaba their faith is the most stronger upon which rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied by saying that no because you are all the time in my company you are all the time in my gathering so your faith is going to be the strongest then at the end rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied by saying that the group of people whose faith is the most strongest are you and i meaning we haven't seen rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam we haven't seen the words of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being revealed like the sahabas were so we without seeing rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam having faith on rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam believing in islam believing in uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the oneness the oneness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then that means that our faith is the most stronger so this is what is meant by here alladhina yu'minuna bil ghaib that the god fearing people they believe in the unseen the second quality which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned is wa yuqimuna as-salah is that they establish salah and obviously the tafsir of this particular fragment or phrase was looked at before and it was from this particular phrase where you keep on salah we went on to talk about some issues where there are differences of opinions among scholars you know issues which people are confused about such as rafi ladain what do the hanafi scholars say with regards to that with regards to where should a person place his hand in namaz should it be below his navel should it be above his navel and so on and so forth so alhamdulillah these issues were looked at in the past couple of weeks or so Now today's tafsir inshallah will be concentrated will be concentrating on verses number 4, 5 and 6 of surah al-baqarah. Now verse number 4 of surah al-baqarah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wal ladina yu'minuna bima unzila ilayka wa ma unzila min qablik. Now with regards to this particular verse majority of the scholars of the view that this verse wal ladina yu'minuna bima unzila ilayka and it is those who believe in what has been revealed to you wa ma unzila min qablik and what has been revealed before you now this particular verse the majority of the scholars of the view that this is a continuation 
of the previous verse. Now what does that mean? In the previous verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes some qualities and characteristics of the god fearing people. He says that, يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ They believe in the unseen. Number two, وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ That they establish salah. Number three, وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُ يُنْفِقُونَ That whatever ni'mah, whatever wealth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them, they spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, majority of scholars say that this particular verse, i.e. verse number four, is a continuation of their characteristic. It's a condi- continuation of their praise. That, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْكَ that these god feeding people also, along with establishing their salah, along with believe in the unseen, along with giving what they possess in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they believe in what has been revealed to you. Bima unzila ilayka means they believe what has been revealed to you, i.e. the Qur'an which was revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they believe in the Qur'an. And at the same time, wama unzila bin qabli. And these God-fearing people, they also believe what has been revealed before you. The scriptures, the Bible, the Torah, which was revealed before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Whatever scriptures was revealed to Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, or the scriptures revealed to Hazrat Dawood alayhi salam, Hazrat Sulaiman alayhi salam, they also believe in that as well. Now, looking at this particular verse in terms of its Masla or the Fiqhi aspect of it. From this particular verse, we can deduce a very important definition of Iman, or a very important, you could say, fundamental part of Iman. And that is that Iman is not restricted to believe, believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in only Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa At the same time, you have to believe in the previous prophets. You have to believe in the prophets which were sent before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You have to believe in the books and the scriptures which were revealed before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa If a person just says, I just believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Allah daqsi, I don't believe that there were any prophets before, I don't believe in Hazrat Isa alayhi salam or Hazrat Sulaiman alayhi salam or Dawood alayhi salam, I don't believe in their books and so on, then that person is not a mu'min, that person is not a believer. These are also fundamental parts of Iman, these are also fundamental principles of Iman. Even though we may not say it verbally, because obviously when we say the Kalima verbally, he only says that we only testify that there is only one God besides Allah, and that Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is Allah's Rasul, and is Allah's uh, Prophet, and is Allah's slave. That's what we say. But these things are also part of Iman as well. To believe in the previous Prophet, and at the same time to believe in the scriptures and the books which were revealed before you, that is also a fundamental part of your belief. Now, that is one particular interpretation of this particular verse, and that is that it is a continuation of verse number three. However, the great Sahabi, Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Mas'ud anhu, has said with regard to verse number four of Surah Al-Baqarah, that this particular verse is not a continuation of the praise or the characteristics of the god feeding people. But instead, Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Masood anhu has said that during Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's time, there are two types, or there were two types of believers, or there were two types of Muslims. The first type of Muslim, or the first type of believers, are those who did not have a religion before. Like, for example, many of the Sahabas who followed their forefathers' religion, who were living in the time of ignorance, ayyam al who were following their desires and so on and so forth. Then, when Rasulullah came with the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they saw Rasulullah, they saw the nur which was emitting from Rasulullah's face, and they realized that later we watch in Kazab that this person cannot be a liar, they became believers. So the characteristics of those Sahabas, or those companions, are found in verse number 3. That those companions who did not have a religion before, who were following their forefathers' religion, who were following their desires, then they became believers, and they became such strong believers, such staunch believers, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ and then Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu goes on to say that then there is another 
type of believers or there is another category of believers and the another category of believers are those believers who were Jews before who were Christians before who believed in Prophet Musa salam, who believed in Sayyiduna Isa salam, who believed in their scriptures who believed in the Torah who believed in the Bible and so on and then when Rasulullah came with the message of Islam these people they straight away became Muslim like Kabe Ahbar who was a, a, a scholar a Jewish scholar or Abdullah bin Salam again another Jewish scholar but when they saw Rasulullah and when they listened to what Rasulullah was bringing forward they became believers straight away so Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Masul is saying that this verse number 4 is about those believers who وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ that those companions, those Sahaba, such as Kabi Ahbar anhu, such as Abdullah bin Salam anhu, they believe in what has been revealed to you. They believe in you, Ayy Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They believe in the Quran which was revealed to you, and at the same time, Wama unzila bin public, they believe in the scriptures which was revealed to them, i.e., to the Jews like the Torah which was revealed to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, the Bible which was revealed to Hazrat Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam. They believe in that. So the gist of it is that Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Masud al Anhu is saying that verse number three talks about those companions, those Sahabas who did not have a religion before. We were following their forefathers' religion, who you could say were idol worshippers, and then after that when Rasulullah came with the message of Islam, they believed in Rasulullah. So verse number three is describing their characteristics, it's describing their qualities, whereas verse number four is describing the qualities of those Jews, those Christians who were Jews and Christians before, but when Rasulullah came with the uh, blessed message of Islam, they became believers straight away. And this particular interpretation of Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Masud al-Anhu can be further supported by a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih al-Muslim. Where the Prophet of Allah had said that there are three types of people and they will receive double reward. Ajrahum marratain. The first type of people is that slave who fulfilled the command of his master and at the same time he fulfilled the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that slave is living under his master and whenever the master tell him do this do that he fulfills those commands he doesn't argue back with the master he doesn't be slack in those commands and so on so he does that and at the same time whenever he's free he fulfills the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i.e. he prays his namaz, he prays his salah, he does his zikr, he does his tasbih and so on and so forth so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying in this hadith that such a person will get double reward ajrahu marratay the second category of people is that master who has a slave girl under him he has a slave girl and he educates this slave girl he teaches her good manners and when she reaches the age of puberty or when she reaches that age where she is ready to get married the master frees this slave girl and then he gets married to her so Rasulullah has said that this master will receive double reward when she was a slave the master you know he tried his best he gave her teaching he educated her you know he did everything for her so that she can become a good person and then when she reached the age that age where normally a person gets married the master frees her and then he marries her that master will get double reward so that is the second category and the third category in which Rasulullah has said that a person will get double reward is that person who was a Jew before who was a Christian before who believed in their respective prophets who believed in Sayyiduna Musa salam, who believed in Sayyiduna Isa salam, who believed in their respective books the Torah, the Injil, the Bible and so on and then when Rasulullah came, they believed in Rasulullah, they believed in the Holy Quran. Rasulullah is saying that these people will get double reward, will get ajrahum marratain. So that is the definition or the interpretation given by Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Mas'ud. One other topic which can be deduced from this particular verse, very briefly, we're just going to touch on this. Like some Mufassirin, such as 
Mufti Muhammad Shafi Rahmatullah in his Ma'rif al-Quran has written, has mentioned, is that from this particular verse, the finality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa or the finality of prophethood can be established from this particular verse. Now, with regards to our belief, okay, it is, as all of you know, that it is necessary that you have to believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa If you just believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or if you just believe in God, but don't believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then that iman or that faith is not valid. Because you find many non-Muslims, you say that well, we believe in Allah, we believe in one God and so on. We believe that there is a creator behind this world. But they do not believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So such a faith or just to believe in Allah and not in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa such an iman and such a faith is considered invalid. Now along with having faith in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it is also necessary that we have to believe that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the last prophet. If anybody holds belief that Rasulullah is a prophet, but after that there will be another prophet, then again such a person's iman would not be considered valid. So you have to believe in Rasulullah to be a prophet, but at the same time you have to believe that Rasulullah is the final prophet and there will be no prophet after him. Now the way the Mufassirin have established the point that we can deduce the finality of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or the finality of Prophet from this particular verse is from this particular fragment at the end where Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Wama unzila min qabli," and what has been revealed before you. Now there are many places in the Holy Quran where Allah subhanahu wa taala says to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that before you we sent Prophet, like "Wala qad arsalna rusulam min qabli." that before you, or indeed before you, we sent prophets, or before you, we sent scriptures, we sent books, and so on and so forth. And there is nowhere mentioned in the Holy Quran, or there is no kind of indication in the Holy Quran, that after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa there is going to be another prophet, or there is going to be a scripture, or a book reveal, or a new sharia, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it's always min qablika, it's always before, before, that before there were books, before there were prophets, before there was this, before there was that. So from this particular verse, many Mufassirin have established, wama unzila min qablik, that what has been revealed before you, indicating that there is not going to be any prophet after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That everything happened before, but this is like a new religion, a new Sharia, and this Sharia and this religion will abrogate the previous religion, will abrogate Judaism, will abrogate Christianity, and this religion will stay all the way until the Day of Judgment. Whereas, when we look at the scriptures of Sayyiduna Isa salam, like the Bible, or when we look at the Torah, then we find many places in the Bible itself, or in the Torah itself, where... Prophet Musa alayhi salam, where Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam indicate, or they actually some places explicitly say that there will be a prophet will come after us. Like it's mentioned in Surah Al-Sof, where, uh, as all of you know, where it's mentioned, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes that when Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam, when he goes to the people of Banu Israel, and he says that, inni Rasulullah ilaykum musaddiqal lima bayna yadayya min al-Tawrah, that verily I'm a prophet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've come here to verify what is mentioned in the Torah. And at the same time, وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولِ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدِ And also to give glad tidings on a prophet who will come after me, whose name will be Ahmad. So when we look in the previous book, the previous religion, when Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam went to give da'wah to the people of Israel when Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam they, when, they, when they were giving da'wah they always reminded their people that they will always be a prophet after us however nowhere in the Quran is there any indication that after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam there will be a prophet and this as I said has been established through this last particular phrase وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكْ that what has been revealed before you and obviously this is a topic which I'm going to mention later on in uh, Surah Al-Ahzab, where it's more in detail, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ That verily Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is not father of one of you. That he's not your father. 
However, walakin Rasulullahi wa khataman nabiyyin. However, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the prophet or is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa khataman nabiyyin and he is the last of all the prophets. Okay, many people have used this particular verse from Surah Al-Ahzab and they twisted their meaning in such a way so that they can fulfill their kind of desires and so on. So obviously the distorted meaning given by some will be looked at inshallah when we look at Surah Al-Ahzab. Now the last portion of uh, verse number 4 of Surah Al-Baqarah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَبِلْ آخِرَتِهُمْ يُوْقِنُونَ And upon the hereafter or on hereafter or in the hereafter they have faith. That these God-fearing people whether we act upon the interpretation of Sayyidina Abdullah bin Masur anhu, we say that there's two types of God-fearing people or whether we act upon the interpretation given by the majority of the scholars here, this characteristic of وَبِلْ آخِرَتِهُمْ يُوْقِنُونَ applies for everyone. Now whether they were, whether, those, whether these Sahabas were Jews or Christians before and then they became believers, or whether they did not have a religion before and then they became believers, this characteristic applies for both of them. And that is وَبِلْ آخِرَتِهُمْ يُوْقِنُونَ that in the hereafter, they have faith. Now, with regards to this particular characteristic, again, again as I mentioned, that this is also a very important part of Iman, that you have to believe in life after death, that you have to believe in the hereafter, that you have to believe that this world we're living in is temporary, that any actions which we have done, whether they are good or bad, will be asked and will be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, and if we have done more good actions than bad, then inshallah we will enter Jannah, we will enter Paradise however if we've done more bad than good and we haven't repented for it then more likely we will enter Hell for a certain period of time now with regards to this particular belief وَبِلْ آخِرَتِهُمْ يُوْقِنُونَ many non-Muslim like you could say scholars or many non-Muslim philosophers and thinkers have said that this belief in the hereafter they've described it as a revolutionary belief. That this is one of the difference between religion given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and man-made religion. Those religions which are man-made, which are not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like for example, you say Hinduism and Sikhism and so on, they don't believe in the hereafter. Whereas all those religions which have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they believe in the hereafter. So many non-Muslim people have actually described it as revolution, this belief as revolution. Now you may be thinking that how is belief in the hereafter as revolution? Now the way belief in the hereafter is revolutionary in that having belief in the hereafter rectifies a person's inner or spiritual side, rectifies a person so that he can come in line with society, he can come in line with religion, he can come in line with modesty and morality. Just for example, if we didn't have this kind of subconscious belief that we will die one day and then we'll be questioned with regards to our deeds, then many of us wouldn't have been religious. If we had this kind of belief that there's no Jannah, there's no paradise, there's no fire of hell, then we would have been just messing around. There would be no one in the mosque, there would be no one in the massages, we will be doing drugs, we will be drinking and so on. Because obviously, we know that there is no jannah, there is no paradise and there is no punishment. But it's because of this thought in our back of our mind. Even though we may be doing sin, it doesn't actually, actually prevent us from doing sin, even though we may be doing sin. But at the same time, we have this kind of subconscious thought in our mind that look, if I keep on doing this, then just say if I was to die tomorrow, or if I was to die now, then I was to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, then what am I going to say? And it's because of these kind of thoughts, it rectifies a person. It's because of these kind of thoughts, it sorts a person out and he gets more better, he kind of spiritually wants to get more better. And that's why we see many brothers, like, whilst they were young, they weren't religious, but when they hit their 30s, 40s and so on, they change their life. Now why do they change their life? It's not because that they just want to change their life, it's because they 
think to themselves, I look, in the next 10, 15 years, 20 years or so, I'm going to pass away, then what I'm going to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I haven't done any good deeds at all, I've always done bad deeds and so on, so what I'm going to do in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So it's because of these kind of thoughts, it changes people. Thoughts of the hereafter changes people that what they're going to do in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we were sinful, then we'll go to the fire of hell, then you know, the punishment of the fire of hell and so on. It's because of these kind of thoughts, it changes and rectifies the person. Now, you may be thinking that, you know, like for example, as all of you know, drinking alcohol is haram and doing adultery and zina and fornication is haram. So, therefore, the Islamic penal system which is known in Islam as hudud, then that acts as a deterrent. So obviously when a person thinks that, oh, if I steal something, then my hand will be cut off, then that should prevent him from stealing. How is it that thinking about the hereafter will prevent that person from stealing and not about uh, the punishment which he may face in this world if he was to steal? Now the answer to that is that punishment is such that for a habitual criminal, punishment is nothing for him. A person who steals or who's got a habit of you know, doing fornication and adultery, for him, getting whipped 100 times is nothing. Like he'll just think to himself, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll just get whipped 100 times and then the next day he'll do fornication again. Or like for example, or if you know if a person in an Islamic state was to drink alcohol, he will get whipped 80 times. So if a person is a habitual drinker, he'll think to himself, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll just drink a glass of wine today, I'll get 80 whips and so on. And he'll get, because what happens is that when a person is a habitual criminal, and the more punishment you implement on him, the less effect it has. That's why many lecturers and teachers have said that those students who are misbehaving in class, if you tell them, oh, you got detention for two weeks, then what will happen is that instead of that detention reforming that particular student, it will make that student rebel against the teacher. Because the more punishment you give, say, oh, you got detention after class, or you got detention after school for two weeks, or for one month, and so on, and every day that student is coming in for detention after school, after class, that student very, you know, is more, you know, far less likely he's going to be reformed. Instead, he's going to rebel against you, because you're giving him more punishment. So that's what the Islamic penal system, even though it is a deterrent, but it's not a complete deterrent. It's Thinking about the hereafter, that it acts as the greater deterrent. Because obviously the punishment is only for a specific time. Like it's only for that 10, 20 minutes or so when you're getting ripped, and then after that you're back to normal again. However, in the punishment of the hereafter, which I will describe in a bit, those punishments are everlasting. And it's this sort of everlasting punishment that changes a person's mentality. Now, obviously from this particular issue which I'm talking about here after, let's mention a couple of things that I was saying that in Islam, if this is a principle of Islam, is that you shouldn't give a person punishment too much. That the reason why the danger is that the more punishment you give, then the more he will get used to this punishment and the less effect it will have with him. And this principle is deduced in many, or which is found in many Messiahs and many Islamic religions. As all of you know, that if you were to drink or eat or engage in sexual intercourse intentionally in the month of Ramadan, then you have to fast 60 days continuously. You have to give kafara, which is like a form of punishment. However, the Islamic jurists have said that if a person, say for example, the first day of Ramadan, he acts intentionally. The second day of Ramadan, he again, he acts intentionally. The third day of Ramadan, he acts intentionally. So that person he will not fast continuously for 180 days. Instead, there will only be one punishment. And that is that he will only fast for 60 days. Because obviously the more punishment you implement on that person, the more he will rebel against you. That's why it's mentioned, like if you look in Al-Hidayah, the Hanafi jurisprudence book, that if a person committed adultery, he's, uh, he's not married and he committed adultery, let's say he committed adultery 20 times and then he gets caught, then you don't implement 2,000 whips on him, because for each adultery you do 100 whips. You don't implement 2,000 whips on him, but instead there's only one punishment, and that is that he'll only be whipped 100 times, and so on and so forth. So that's what I'm trying to say, that this is a very important principle in Islam, and that is that you shouldn't give 
too much punishment on that person because the more punishment you give, the you know far less likely he's going to uh, he's going to reform that person. More likely he's going to rebel against you. And that's why when it comes to the punishment of cutting your hands, like if you're stealing, in the Hanafi jurisprudence it says that if a person was caught stealing once, then he cut his right hand. If he's caught stealing again, then he cut his left foot. Then after that, if he's caught stealing the third time, then you don't implement the punishment. You just put him into prison or you just let him go. Why? Because the more punishment you're going to implement on that person, the far less likely he's going to report. So this is a very important principle in Islam, and that is that don't give too much punishment. And, that's, and this is a principle which, like as I said, nowadays lecturers and, and teachers are just finding out that instead of like giving the students or misbehaving students like detention all the time, they try to think of other kind of ways and avenues to reform that student. And that's why Islam says that don't carry out punishment all the time, you know, reform that person, you know, send him to like masajid so that he can speak to the imam, send him for these kind of dini work and so on, and that's how a person reforms, a person doesn't reform through just punishment and so on. Now, as I was just saying, just to finish this particular verse off, verse number four, that it's basically thought of the hereafter, that kind of reforms a person. And what is the thought of the hereafter? It's a thought of, like, for example, punishment in the grave, punishment in the fire of hell. That kind of changes a person. Like is mentioned in the hadith of Sunan al-Darmi, narrated by Sayyiduna Abu Sa'id al-Khudri al-Anhu, that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has said that if a sinner, if a fasik, when he passes away and he enters his grave, then 99 snakes will be thrown or will be put on that particular sinner. And the snakes will bite that person. These 99 snakes would bite on that person all the way until the day of judgment. And if the venom or the spit of the snake was to fall on this earth, then the venom of the snake being so poisonous and so powerful that nothing on this earth will ever grow again. So these kind of hadiths. Or like the hadith of Sunan Abu Dawood where the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam describes, talks about the punishment of a backbiter, that a person who backbites against his Muslim brother, against his Muslim sister, what punishment he will get. And it comes in the hadith that he will be in the grave, he will be in his grave and his nail will turn into copper. And this person will scratch his face. He will scratch his face, he will scratch his mouth and everything. He will take his mouth and his tongues and his gums, everything out until nothing will remain in his mouth. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will restore his face back again and then he will again scratch his uh, mouth and his tongue with his copper nail all the way until the day of judgment. It's these kind of things when we hear about the day of judgment, when we hear about the punishment of the grave, when we hear about the dwellers of the fire of hell, that the, the person or the l- person who will receive the least punishment in the fire of hell is that a person who will be given shoes made out of fire and this will cause his brain to boil. And obviously comes in another hadith that this punishment is uh, reserved, if you say, for Abu Talib, who was the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So if Abu Talib, who, because he helped Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa all the time, he's a disbeliever, but he helped Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa all the time, he will receive this kind of light punishment. And it's not a light punishment, you know, having your brains boiled. So imagine what kind of punishment will a sinner will have. So it's these kind of thoughts when we, like when a scholar gives a talk about fire of hell and he mentions these kind of things, that's when a person realizes that, oh look, I need to sort myself out, I need to get me more religious, I need to come to the mosque, read my prayers, read the Quran, any kind of prayers which I miss, I have to do that. If I've hurt anybody, if I've backbited about a person, I need to seek forgiveness from him. It's these kind of things that rectifies a person and because of this reason, non-Muslims, People have said, وَبِلْ آخِرَةِ هُمْ يُوْقِنُونَ That having faith in the hereafter, they've described it as a revolutionary belief. Verse number 5 of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَىٰ هُدَمْ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ That these God-fearing people, it is they who are on guidance, given by the Lord, and it is they who are successful. Now very quickly, verse number 6, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ That verily those people who have disbelieved, كَفَرُوا Those people who have disbelieved, whether سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ That whether you warn them, 
anzartahum here means that whether you warn these people am lam tunzirhum or whether you do not warn them la yu'minun these disbelievers these kafir would never become believers now before we look at the tafsir of verse number 6 just like to point towards one of the beauty of the holy quran and that is that in the holy quran whatever allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a certain group of people then in the next verse or in the next paragraph allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will talk about the opposite of that group of people so for example allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he talks about paradise he talks about the blessings of paradise then in the next paragraph Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will talk about fire of hell. We'll talk about the dwellers of the fire of hell. We'll talk about the punishment of fire of hell. If in a particular verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the righteous people, the salihi, then in the next verse or the next paragraph Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will talk about the sinners, we'll talk about the fasting, we'll talk about the transgressors. Now again, when we look at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, the first few verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the God-fearing people. That the God-fearing people are those who believe in the unseen, where you keep moon salah, they establish salah, or mimma razaqna min they believe in what has been revealed before you, what has been revealed to you, and they believe in the hereafter. Then from verse number six, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna lazina kafaru, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the disbelievers. So the first paragraph Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the believers, and then the next paragraph Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the disbelievers, and in this particular section, again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afterwards will talk about the munafiqin, will talk about the hypocrites. So this is one of the beauty of the Holy Quran, or beauties of the Holy Quran, and that is that where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a particular group or something, then straight away in the next paragraph or the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will talk about the opposite of that group, or will talk about the opposite of that particular thing. Now just very briefly the uh, tafsir of this particular verse is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who have disbelief in the kafaru irrespective of whether you warn them or whether you warn them am lam tunzirhum or whether you do not warn them these people will not become believers. Now this is a very important uh, verse in terms of like the interpretation of this particular verse is slightly ambiguous because when we look at the verse in its on its face value it says that all disbelievers in the lazina kafaru whether you warn them or whether you do not warn them it doesn't matter فهم لا يؤمنون, they're not going to become believers so when we look at this verse it says there that there's no need for a muslim to give da'wah to a non-muslim because the verse is quite clearly saying that even if you were to give them da'wah even if you were to propagate to them, or even if you do not propagate to them, it doesn't matter, they're not going to become believers, so there's no point in you going and giving them that one, so on. However, as I said, this contradicts the other verses of the Holy Quran, where Rasulullah is saying that you should give that one to the non-Muslims and so on. So the interpretation, or the correct interpretation, or the true interpretation of this particular verse is, that this verse was revealed about those disbelievers, in which it has been written in taqdeer that they will die as kafir, that they will die in the state of disbelief, such as Abu Jahal and Abu Lahab, who gave hardship to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam hundreds of times, many times, would approach them, would talk to them about Islam, would talk to them about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa taala, would talk to them that they, you should believe me, and they will be savior in this. However, these people like Abu Jahal. Abu Lahab, their tribes and so on, they did not believe in Islam, they did not believe in the message of Rasulullah So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse and he says that those disbelievers in which it has been written in taqdeer and in faith that they will die in the state of disbelief if even if you go to them and give them da'wah, even if you go to them and warn them about the punishment that hereafter, or even if you don't, it doesn't matter, la yu'minun, they will never ever become believers. So remember this particular verse is just talking about those disbelievers in which it has been written in taqdeer that they will die in the state of kufr and they will start die in the state of disbelief. However, this as I said, not talking about the general non-Muslims because obviously the general non-Muslims because we do not know whether they're going to die in disbelief and so on. So therefore it is our obligation, it is necessary for us that we have to give da'wah to non-Muslims as well.
Okay, it's just not that way. Just not restricted to just Muslims. At the same time, we need to give that what to non-Muslims as well. We need to call them towards the Islam. You know, tell them about Islam. The very least, what we can do is that any kind of reservations they may have about Islam, any kind of misconception they may have about Islam, then the very least we should clarify that for them. And sometimes, like you know, as I said, da'wah. There's many forms of da'wah. It's not necessarily they have to give a talk to them for da'wah to happen. Sometimes actions speak louder than words. So even the way you behave, if you behave in a good way, with akhlaq, with good conduct and so on, that is also a form of da'wah. And they may, you know, the misconceptions they may have about Islam, when they see you, the way you act, the way you are, the tawazu, the uh, humility, the humility, uh, the uh, humbleness in yourself, then that, that may change their uh, outlook on Islam and that may change some of the misconceptions they may have about Islam. Inshallah, we we'll leave it at this particular verse for uh, this week, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq tracks of what has been said. Uh, before we finish, just like uh, just to clarify on some of the messiahs or some questions which brothers have sent uh, in the last week or so. Uh, the first masla was with regards to uh, the masla which I actually mentioned last week is with regards to zakat and mortgage. That if a person has a mortgage, then how should he give his zakat and so on. So as I mentioned last week that the installment which you are supposed to give for that particular year, you'll subtract that from your uh, zakatable asset. So just say for example, like you've got 100,000 pounds savings and for that particular year, you are going to give 20,000 um, pounds to the mortgage company. So what will happen is that you'll only subtract 20,000 pounds from your zakatable asset, are you 100,000 pounds, and then give zakat on the remaining 80,000 pounds. Now, with regards to this masla, one thing which I didn't clarify last week is that when you come to subtract your installments for that year, you'll just subtract the lawful amount, <coughs> not the interest amount. Okay? So, just say, for example, you were going to give to the mortgage company 20,000 pounds. But 18,000 pounds of it is lawful, like what you're supposed to be giving, and the 2,000 pounds is because of the interest. So in that situation, you'll only subtract 18,000 pounds and not 2,000 pounds. Because something which is haram, then, and you've been in debt or you're in debt because of some haram thing, then you do not subtract that from your zakatable asset. Just say, for example, if a person, he's a gambler, and then he's been gambling and lost, and he's in like 20,000 pounds in debt. And then at the end of the year, he's got like, 30,000 pounds saving. So because the 20,000 pounds in debt he is in, because he did it through haram way, because he was gambling and that's why he's got into debt, so therefore the ruling is that that gambler, he will not subtract 20,000 pounds from his zakatable assets and just give zakat on 10,000. Instead, he will have to give zakat on everything, even the 30,000 pounds and even the 20,000 pounds as well. So that is the ruling with regards to zakat and mortgages, and that is that you only subtract the lawful amount, the lawful installment, and that, in, that portion of the installment, which is from interest and so on, then you would not subtract that. So that is the first uh, particular masla. The second masla was with regard to Salatul Tasbih. Now, Salatul Tasbih, as all of you know, you know how to read it. And there are hadiths which can be found in Sunan Abu Dawood and Sunan Tirmidhi indicating that Rasulullah Wasallam mentioned or talked about this particular salat. That you read the tasbih subhanallah alhamdulillah wa la ilaha illallah wa allahu akbar 75 times in each rakat so we end up with 300 times so that is something which is proven through the actions of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam now the issue which i wanted to clarify is that there are some people who say that salatul tasbih is something which is weak something which was made up something which is fabricated and it is something which a person should not do okay that is totally incorrect because as i said there is a hadith in sunan abu dawood sunan al-tirmidhi indicating towards uh, that there is some basis of Salatul Tasbih. And on top of that, other muhaddisin such as Imam Nawi Rahmatullah alayhi, Imam Subki and so on, have all mentioned that this namaz, i.e. Salatul Tasbih, the narrators of the hadiths are not weak, they're not da'if, they're not weak narrators, they're not fabricators or anything like that. So therefore, this namaz, i.e. Salatul Tasbih, does have some value and does hold some water. Even to the extent that Sheikh Nasiruddin Albani has even said that you know, the hadiths 
with regards to Salat al i.e. in Sunan Abu Dawah and Sunan al he's even classified those hadiths to be Hassan. Hassan means that uh, to be reliable and so on. So therefore those people who say that Salat al is za'if and weak and so on, and obviously their uh, kind of view is not, uh, is not uh, strong. Why? Because as I said, there's hadith with regards to that, and even Sheikh Nasiruddin Albani has even said that the hadiths with regards to Salat al are considered as Hassan are considered as reliable. So that is the second masla. The third masla was with regards to sunnat muakkad salah and sunnat again muakkad salah. Obviously, there are two types of sunnat which we read. One is considered as the sunnat muakkad, the emphasized sunnah, which we read before zuhur salah, four rakats before zuhur, two after zuhur, and so on. And then there are another type of namaz called sunnat again muakkad which we read four rakats before Asr and four rakats before Isha but there isn't a strong hadith supporting the four before Isha but that is like another thing which we'll talk about later but anyway they are known as Sunnah Yad Muakkadah now the question or the Musla which I need to look at is with regards to the way you read Sunnah Muakkadah and the way you read Sunnah Yad Muakkadah now with regards to Sunnah Yad Muakkadah when you're reading four rakats two rakats they considered as two separate nafas they're considered as two separate units. So therefore, when you come to read Sunnat al Muakkadah, like the four before Asr or the four before Isha, well, you should, you should read it like this, that you read the first two rakats as normal, and then you sit down for your Atayyat. Then after Atayyat, you shouldn't stand up for the third rakat. It's Sunnah and it's preferable that you still remain seated, you read Durud Ibrahim, you read the Dua, Allahumma inni zalam nafsi, then you stand up for the third rakat, and then at the beginning of the third rakat, you read Subhanakallahumma, you read Sana, you read Auzu Billah, you read Bismillah, Surah Fatiha, and then a Surah. Like you would have done if you had read from uh, at the beginning. The reason why is that in Sunnah again, Muqadda, the four rakats you're reading, each unit are considered separate. Like you're reading two separate Nafal Namazi. So therefore it is preferable that when you stand up for the third rakat, you also read the Sana, you read the Awuz, you read Bismillah, Surah Fatiha, and so on and so forth, and then you conclude the Namaz. If a person doesn't or hasn't been doing it, then Namaz will still be valid, why? Because to read Sana and so on, it's only Sunnah. So obviously your Namaz will be valid, but next time when you read your Sunnah again, Muqaddah, so just keep that in mind. Whereas in Sunnah Muqaddah, because it is more similar to a Fard Namaz, or the rulings are considered more similar to a Fard Namaz, that four rakats are considered as one body, so therefore, after you sit down for the second rakat, for the first tashahud, then after you read Atayyat, you stand up for the third rakat, and then without reading Sana, you will just read Surah Fatiha and Surah, and then you will conclude in Namaz. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the Sophie Fakhtabandu wa'alaikum. Sarwafib da'awan, alhamdulillah. Do you have any questions?